Hello Board Game Crusaders, today we're going to be looking at the cooperative and single player version of Conquest of Planet Earth with the Apocalypse expansion. If you're looking for the competitive play, you're not going to see that here. Refer to the other video that I've posted. Here are some of the components that I may be mentioning periodically through the game. This is where you get to find out what those are, so pay close attention. Some of them I will not reference anymore. Some of them I'll be mentioning in the game, and you'll need to know this is what I'm referring to. Let's start with these two. These came in the expansion. They are for specific alien groups, and uh, it'll just be mentioned on the alien card if you need them or not, So, as well as the rules on how to use them. So I won't go into those anymore, but now you know what they look like and how to find out what they do. The Demolish token is something you never really want to see happen to you in this game, in the single player co-op version anyway. Uh, that means that the humans, through technology or human events, have taken away some of your victory points. They've made something that you could potentially work for, or have worked for, and conquered, completely worth nothing. So, in essence, let's say you've got uh, this, this town here. And you have got this little town under control with the conquest and all that good stuff. Um, or even if you don't, it doesn't really matter. Anytime that a card references you demolish something, you place this on it. And that means that this value of zero replaces this value of whatever it may be. So you don't really want to see that ever. Um, another thing that I won't really cover in too much detail here, but you'll probably get the gist of watching the video. I'm going to cover it anyway, just to be completely 100%. This is the randomizer. Anytime that it calls for placing a random unit, which is going to happen quite a bit in the single co-op version of the game, you're going to roll a dice, you got a 5, so then you refer to this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this square right here happens to be the fifth square. That's where whatever is going to take place will take place. Then we have the currency of the game, the Alien Menace tokens, throughout this tutorial, I may call these the currency, the cash, the coins, whatever I may slip up and say, just know I'm referring to the alien menace tokens if it's referring to paying something to do something, unless I specifically say you're paying an action point. Here is the completely useless um, first player turn order marker. You don't really need this anymore, but hey, the frog looks pretty terrified. How cute is that? This is one of the reasons why I love Flying Frog games. They make little tokens that have no rules in the game, and they have seemingly no bearing in the game. So you can make up your own rules, or, more importantly, they can be implemented in future expansions, which Flying Frog Productions prints or, or produces on their website completely free. All you have to do is go read them, print them, whatever, and you can use these for officially sanctioned rules. It's like a free expansion that they throw in the box as a teaser that you just get as soon as they come out with the rules. And then the terror points. These uh, were introduced in the expansion as a solution to places like the grassy fields. Now the grassy fields have their place and playing with them can be pretty fun unless you land on it on your turn. And it's kind of frustrating because it's not worth any victory points. You don't have to fight anything, it's not worth points, it's just a spot that you wasted your activation getting to. Necessary evil. Now, with the terror points, you have an option you did not have before. You can sacrifice your alien, in effect killing it, so that you can place a terror point in that region, making it worth one terror point instead of zero terror points. Now you can only use this on places that have already been that have not already been conquested, that don't have anybody to fight, and don't have any victory points. So keep that in mind when you're trying to sacrifice your unit for the terror points. And of course the conquest I didn't really cover yet, but it should be obvious from that. Conquest markers show you what areas you control. They come in a character matching each flying saucer set so that you can uh, Conquest, and then fly off to capture new regions. These little bad boys are the allies that you can get through space stuff. 
if you come across these, you are a lucky, lucky person. They're really cool, and they help a lot. Um, when you do have these guys in play, they get all of your bonuses, unless the bonus specifically refers to your alien race name. Uh, another difference that you'll notice when we're when we're doing the battle, when your alien gets destroyed, you can typically bring it back in for an action point. I'll cover that in a minute, so don't wrap your head around it too much yet. But uh, needless to say, these guys do not get to come back. If they're destroyed, they're just gone, eliminated, wiped out. The event cards are broken up into two portions. In fact, at the beginning of the game, you're going to divide out the event cards that have the red text on the bottom from the ones that do not, and make two separate draw decks for the event card. You'll keep the event card with the red next to the resistance counter, because that is the resistance draw deck. And then the other one will be for the aliens. Now, when looking at these, for the resistance, you play whatever this is in the red, ignoring the top portion entirely, unless the red thing says that it plays as it reads above. On the resistance ones, you're going to see a couple flavors. You're going to see some with a cost and some with no cost. If it has no cost, you can play it at any time. Typically, it'll help it boost a battle, and you can play it at any time during the battle, even after the dice are rolled. Um, then there's the the ones that cost something. These ones can only be played in the action phase where you're spending action points and it costs that many action points to play whatever the card is. They're not all going to be singles, sometimes they're doubles and so on and so forth. Just depending on how strong the card is. There are several locations in the deck or in the game that you get to draw from. We'll cover that in more detail as we go through the game, as usual. Um, but, here we have the terror points that the location is worth if you conquer it. This is how many resistant uh, battles that you have to fight to conquer it. That is any special abilities or effects that this area may have. These indicate what type of, a plant, of an area it is. Uh, there are certain resistant cards that will interact with these and give the resistance an advantage. There are also event cards that will give you an advantage in specific areas. And then the top has the name of what kind of an area it is. Um, alternately, there is the capital city, which is intended to be placed in the center of the game. Uh, it's kind of the coveted area because it's worth a lot more terror points than some of the others. Alternately, the base game has on the back of that a historic monument, and then the expansion added this alternate capital city with this alternate, um, I guess, the central location for the game. We also have here we have the human tech cards. Human tech cards are drawn periodically through the game on the resistance phase, and they stack and remain in play unless it specifies. You just use it for one effect and then get it out of the way. So stacking, for those unfamiliar with the terminology here, means that if one is played, it remains in play. And if another one is played, they both remain in play. If another one is played, all three remain in play. Now some of them may have instance abilities that are only used once really quickly. Those obviously do not remain in play. You simply follow the rules on the card to see what's going to apply in that case. Now, technically, human tech cards are not considered events. However, any card or ability that could cancel an event can be used to try and cancel human tech. If you do utilize the ability to cancel a human tech, you essentially will roll the six-sided dice. On the results of a four, five, or six, the human tech that you are rolling against gets destroyed. On the result of a one, two, or three, then the attempt failed, human tech remains in play, and if it was an event card you played, you just wasted the event card essentially. The base game comes with the land resistance and the expansion added the coastal resistance. Those are going to function pretty similarly. Um, the expansion also added land type with this coastal symbol. If it has the coastal symbol, uh, you draw from the coastal resistance, or some of the coastal uh, cards Say right here that you roll a dice to determine if they're coming from the land or the sea. 
So you just follow those as needed to determine whether you're using the coastal deck or the land deck. The way the cards are going to break down is you're going to see here um, the name of the card. You're going to see the strength value of the card, which you're comparing against your alien strength. If it has any abilities, it'll be here. For instance, this one gains plus four strength in any town. As you recall on these indicators right here, it shows what kind of a location it is. So you just compare that to that to figure out what kind of bonuses these guys get, if any. So and then you're going to see if they're soft or hard or none of the above, which just basically means to the alien if they're chewy, they're soft, if they're crunchy, they're hard. And some of the alien factions give you special abilities depending on soft, hard. Not all of them though, so that really doesn't come up as often as you'd think. Um, other hero or other resistance types are the heroes. It says right there if it's a hero, everything else is pretty similar except if you draw a hero card, you also draw the next card after it and you combine those powers. So that gives a plus one strength to whatever you drew plus this ability to whatever you drew. And then whatever you drew not only has what it has, but it has this additional. So in this case, we drew a U.S. Army Artillery with a Forest Ranger. How cool is that? There are a large variety of resistance tokens in the game, and uh, they all play a little bit differently. Sometimes they have abilities which maybe you don't know what that ability means, like what's well, Barrage, for instance. Who knows? Well. You will know as soon as you look on the back of the manual, and then you can see right here, there's the resistance abilities all laid out. So you can just have those at your fingertips while you're playing the game if you need them. They're really easy to remember once you've played a game or two. So these are pretty straightforward to read. As we can see here, that's an air type, um, which can interact with your specific aliens. Uh, depending on their abilities. Uh, that is the strength, which equates essentially to this, if it were a card. And it's got the ability, the ability right here on the bottom. This one gives a crushing victory on a five or six. As we can see from the original paratroopers, it also gives a crushing victory on a fight roll of five or six. So that's pretty much how these work with the addition of this little circle um, being outlined in red indicates that it's a soft creature indicated by the blue border um, shows that it's a hard uh, resistance. Now these big ones are also a little different in the fact that the little ones do not offer you victory points for defeating them. They're just hindrances. If you end a movement or you, you really can't move through them. If you hit a square that has one of these tokens in it, you have to stop there and you have to fight them. Uh, whereas uh, these guys, not only do you have to stop there and fight them if they're there, but you have to defeat them twice. You have to defeat them once, they flip over, you have to defeat them a second time, and then if you can do that, you get a terror point. If you can't, it remains like this for the next person to come across and pick up half the battle that you've already done half the work for them. So uh, that brings to another important point when placing these. Um, we already know how the randomizer works. So let's say the infantry are kicking it right here and you draw a paratrooper and the paratrooper is supposed to go right here. What's going to happen is the paratrooper goes in, the infantry moves to the middle. And that continues that way. Now the middle can only ever have three um, indicators or resistance counters at, a, at any given time. If there are more than that, then um, the one that's trying to move in can't move in, it gets blocked, and it stays here until there's three here. So hopefully that doesn't ever happen. <laughs> now, that brings you to a question, probably. The question in your mind is, well, what if this isn't the city capital? What if this is my starting position? Well, that simply means you can still play an action point as usual to put aliens in here, but then the aliens can't do anything that turn. They can't begin moving. They have to immediately resolve battle um, because they can't move when they're there. The rules also do not clarify these guys since they can only come in at the ports indicated by the anchor symbol. 
It doesn't say how these guys move in, but I would presume that uh, if a paratrooper was supposed to land where the aircraft carrier is, the aircraft carrier is in fact not going to move in because it's in a water zone. Um, you would have to move the paratrooper in. But since the rules aren't clear on that, at least the, the rules that came printed with the game, they may have a FAQ later, you can either move the paratrooper in or you can say the paratrooper is going to be there. Um, whatever you want to do. If you decide to play a single player game, you are going to set up the board like this. With your aliens starting in this square, all four of whatever color you've, just, you've chosen starting right there, Sorry for the half paint paint job. I haven't quite finished my set yet. Um, work in progress. But you put your four there, and then you put the capital city there. That's for a solo game, right there. If you're looking to play cooperatively, those rules are outlined on page seven of the base game, with a two-player setup, with player one alien starting here, player two alien starting here, working as a team, with the capital city in the center um, right there. Uh, three players set up, player one, player two, player three, with the city there. Four players set up, one, two, three, four, with the city there. That's on page seven of the base rules. Page five of the um, expansion rules are going to show you how to do a five and six player cooperative setup. Five player goes player one, two, three, four, five, with two different uh, capital cities or whatever you're using. As you recall, the capital city has the reverse side, so you can choose. Um, but you'll use two of them in that setup. Or there's the six player setup one, two, three, four, five, six, with the two capitals in the middle again. The next part of setup is uh, choosing your alien. There's several ways to do that. If you just like one of the aliens, you can choose it. If everyone agrees to what aliens they choose. Otherwise, you can just deal them out randomly. Or you can do a deal two, pick one situation. Um, but here you've got the strength and the intelligence. Once you have your alien, you draw that many event cards to match your intelligence from the alien event deck. And then you're going to get one of the uh, currency coins, just a single here, for each player to start with. And then, for every tile, you're going to roll a six-sided dice for the randomizer here to place one unit um, from the resistance tokens on a random location. Uh, if there's a, an area where the aliens are starting, two units in the center locations. So let's just say we've got a six here. So we're putting a random resistance there. And then here, since it's the middle, we're going to do two. We've got a three, which is here. And we got a five, which is here. You're also going to want to set up the resistance phase marker there. Um, even though the resistance phase is really clear and easy to read, you probably don't want to mess with uh, the chance of making the donut move. So the, card, the game also comes with these summaries. They're double-sided, so you can see whatever is happening on each turn. That may be handy to use. You're going to want to put the human tech draw next to that. And then you're going to want to put, remember, the event deck that had the red lettering somewhere where it's separated from your other event deck. Typically, I put it next to the resistance phase counter. So the game is going to play out in a couple of different phases. First the aliens take their turn, and then the resistance takes their turn. And the resistance is all kind of automated, it just works um, as outlined on the resistance phase sheet. We'll go over that in a second. Um, before you get to the alien turn, the first thing that everybody at the table does is you roll a dice. On the roll of a one, how lucky we get to explain that right now. On the roll of a one, you get to get yourself one of these coins and you get to re-roll your one and then honor the second result. So that was probably the best thing you could roll, getting an action point or getting a coin and then getting six action points. Pretty cool. If you were to roll a one again after rolling a one, you do not get the coin this time and you have to honor the one and you just get one action point. And then the game uh, basically proceeds from the person who rolled the lowest 
all the way up to the person that rolled the highest. So even though the person that rolled the lowest may have the lowest action points, they do get to go first, which doesn't really mean much in the cooperative game, but, you know, take it for what it's worth. So after you've rolled, you move to the next step, which is the action phase where you use your actions. Now for the sake of this demonstration, we're going to say that we rolled a 2. The very first thing you need to do is ready any tap or flipped over cards that you have. So that is these cards that have the activate that you can only use once per turn. If you had any that you either tapped or flipped over to indicate you had used it on the previous turn, before you divvy out your actions, you set this right so that you know you can use it again this turn if you'd like to. So what you can do with those actions is you can move one alien one space. So if he wanted two, he could go one, two. And then he could have this location fortified with two aliens instead of one. Or if he wanted to be a little more bold, he could go one, two. So moving aliens is one of the things you can do. Returning a downed alien to the base is another thing. So let's say they had a battle and they lost one or more aliens. For one action point, you can place one of your downed aliens back in your starting zone. Now two action points will give you one of these currencies. Um, so if you spend two action points instead of moving or doing anything else, you just get one of those to utilize. Um, some of the cards, um, the event cards, have a cost value right here as referenced earlier. Now any of these event cards with a cost value can only be utilized during the action phase when you're moving aliens and spending action points. Uh, this would be the time to use them, and as many points as it costs to use it is what you're going to have to spend. So if this guy wanted to play this card, since he only has two, that's all he'd be able to do this turn. And again, the expansion added these little terror things I already covered in great detail, but that's another thing you can choose to spend three of your action points doing. So, um, for this guy's turn, he's going to go one, two. He's going to play it safe. Once you're there, you reveal your location. So he's got a location here. That's the atomic power plant. We already know how this works with all of these symbols and these symbols, so we're not covering that right now. Um, but suffice it to say, it's it's got a resistance of two. So, let's say the blue player was playing with these guys. Their strength is three. That means each of their ships has a strength value of three. So right off the bat, I have six strength going into the battle, because I have two ships. Three and three. Now if I had just one ship, it would just be three, which is why he chose to move two in there, just to be safe. So, after the action phase, you reveal the cards and go into the, bat or the locations that you've moved on to and go into the battle phase. So in the battle phase, you reveal any um, unexplored locations. So this is an unexplored location. We reveal a location card and place it there. Now note this has a resistance of two. That means we're going to go into a fight. I'm not going to explain anything else here because we already covered that in pretty good detail. And uh, so now I've got my two aliens there, and we are going to be having a fight. Now when you're referencing your um, your event card or space stuff, there are a couple different things, uh, so a couple different key terms you're going to want to know. A battle is all fights in a given location. A fight is a single combat. So in this case, if you recall the resistance was two, this will have two fights in it. Now a fight round is a round of fights between actions and resistance, or aliens and resistance. So a fight round would be all two of the fights constituting one fight round. So as you're reading the cards, now you know what a battle, a fight, and a fight round are. Um, you always begin the battle phase, or I guess after you've revealed the locations, by fighting in contested areas. In this case, this is the only contested area, and so we'll run down how the battle works. Um, you draw resistance cards for the first battle. 
And let's say that the blue aliens are these guys. Their strength total, or their strength is 3. That means each uh, UFO that they have has a value of 3, which will come into play here. So that's 3 and 3 makes 6. Now let's see what the resistance has coming for us. Um, it looks like they have a strength of 5. So it's a good thing I moved two aliens in there because already I'm only winning by one point and we haven't even finished yet. Um, then at this point you have an opponent roll a red dice representing the resistance and you roll a white dice representing yourself. You add the values. So in this case there was a tie because my 6 plus 2 tied his 5 plus 3. They both totaled 8. So in the case of a tie, no ground was won, and you did not complete one of the fights. You will have to keep fighting until there is a victor to solve the round. So here we have a strength of 3. So far this looks favorable because I have a strength of 6. So I think I can do this. You roll the dice again, so they have 6 total, and I have 10 total. That means I defeated one of the two needed to capture the area. So that, again, was a fight. Now let's try to complete the fight round by doing this again. Here we have the Duke, who is a hero, who has a strength of plus three to whatever you draw next, and Cunning, which means he rolls an extra fight dice and uses the highest value. That might be pretty tricky. So, we have a cunning, um, another hero. So that's going to add, this is just going to be bad for the aliens. And, oh my goodness, is that another hero? <laughs> so, we're going to ignore everything except the cunning so far, just for the sake of speed. So already though, they're at 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and they haven't even got their base yet. And another hero. So there's 9. If this is a hero, I'm just going to say it's not. Oh, good. <laughs> and look at that. That's a heavy tank. So they're at 17, and I'm at 6. I think, even rolling my dice, I am SOL, unless I get a 6. Now, if I were to get a 6, it would be a crushing blow, and I would automatically win. If the resistance gets a 6, it's a crushing blow, and they automatically win. If we both get a 6, it's a tie, and the battle was just doesn't count towards anything. So let's roll the dice again looking for the red for the resistance. They got a six, so it doesn't matter what I got. I took a defeat here. As if I had any chance anyway with all that they had. My only hope was to get a six. Now in that slaughter that we just witnessed, or any time that more than one human is drawn in a particular fight, so there's a hero, we draw another one, there's more than one drawn in this fight. You draw a human or a resistance event card, remember the ones with the red on the bottom, and you play that um, as indicated. So again, any time that two or more humans are drawn in a particular fight, not a fight round, not a battle, but a fight, uh, then you immediately, out of the regular sequence, play a resistance uh, event. So... Claire, another point here is if I did have any event cards that I could play, you can play those at any time unless it specifies otherwise on the event card, even after the dice are rolled. So if I had something that would make me get a 6, I could roll my dice first. If I didn't get my 6 naturally, I could play it at this point. You can play those at any time to, to buff yourself or to hurt a friend that you're playing against or whatever. But in this case, I lost. I have a couple of choices. First of all, this isn't a choice. My guy gets defeated. He comes off the board. Again, I can use a, a, an action point to put him back on my next turn, but for now, he is gone. Now I have one alien left and one battle left. I have a choice to make. I can fight on and hope that I get a better resistance draw this time around, or I can try to run away like a coward with my tail between my legs to any surrounding area that I have a friendly figure in. These are always considered uh, for the purpose of retreating friendly with a enemy in, or with a with a unit and even if it was empty you could always retreat to your friendly home base so in this case I don't know if I want to risk it 
It's worth three points. I've already defeated one of them. If I do retreat and decide to come back with more friends, I would have to start over with my two. I would be essentially having to fight two again. So rather than just risking that, I think I'm going to risk losing my ship. And I'm going to say I'm going to fight again. Hopefully live to see another day. Not so bad. Um, it's just that, well, maybe it is. It's an eight. <laughs> I've only got a strength of three. As you'll recall, my buddy was killed. So if I can roll myself a six, or what else do I need? Well, I guess it depends on what he rolls. So I'm just hoping for a six. Again, they're red, I'm white. Okay, so we tied on that, which means he won, and I just lost the fray. No big deal. We'll come back, try to win another day. Again, we have to start back from scratch. Now, let's say for instance that the paratrooper was summoned there. Let's kind of redo that battle. Um, if there was one or more of these tokens on the land, before fighting the land, I'd have to fight these guys off, which aren't worth any victory points or anything. They're just a hindrance for you. So you really don't want to see them on in your way because you have to fight them before you can go for the victory. If there's more than one of these on a spot, you fight them in whatever order you determine you'd like to. Battle works the same, except instead of drawing random cards, you just fight against that value. So after the battle phase, you have your draw phase, which as you'll recall, you have a certain number of event cards, of event cards equal to your intelligence. If you've got this hand, for instance, and you really don't like this card, you don't think you'll ever use it, when you get to your draw phase, you can always discard one of the cards that you don't think you'll want and then draw back up to your hand. So if I only had this card and I didn't think I'd use it, I could discard it and draw three more in the case of these guys because their intelligence is three. Or if I had three cards, I could discard one so I could draw one to hopefully get a fresher hand than what I've got. Winning conditions in the single player or cooperative scenario is, depending on how many people are playing in a single player, you get 8 terror points to win. In a 4 player game you're working collectively to get 32 points and so on. This is all referenced on page 18 of the standard rule book. So you can just have that handy so you know what you're going for at the beginning of the game when you're starting. 